Hey, y'all can have a seat there. And uh, my name is Chris. If we haven't seen each other lately, it's because my kids keep getting married, and uh, which is good. But having them get married very quick to, close to each other is a little bit of a challenge. So I bring you greetings from North Carolina and Virginia and D.C. and Oregon and places in between. Um, yeah, it's good to be back today. Uh, if you can't tell, I'm a little under the weather. For some reason, our staff decided to play our very own game of Survivor. <laughs> Matt was the first off, followed by Teresa, and then with uh, Stephen, and then Jenny, and then Lachlan, and I was holding strong. I was like, I'm going to win this prize. You say, what is that prize? You get to do extra work. That's the prize. <laughs> And then yesterday morning, I was off the island. So it is good to be with you today. Uh, Turn to Acts chapter 1. It feels really good to say that. Turn to Acts chapter 1, if you would. I'm going to go over a couple of quick announcements, and then we're going to do a few other things, and then we'll do our intro today to Acts. Hey, look, if you're new or uh, your first time, second time, and if you haven't filled out one of these little connect cards in your bulletin, would you do us a favor? Uh, would you just fill that out for us at some point? And then at the end of the service, we have a guest central desk out there in the foyer. If you would take that card and tear it off, it's very, very, very gratifying to do that. Very gratifying. If you would take that card, fill it out, drop it off at the Welcome Center out there, we'd love to um, get to know you a little bit better. We have a gift for you. And then just the other thing I really want to focus on and mention is uh, next week, what, Tuesday, our, yeah, Tuesday is uh, our fall festival. So we, um, we'd like to have a bunch of trunks for Trunk or Treat. And so far, we do not have many registered. Now, I know it's always fun to press, stress me out <laughs> and wait to the last minute, you know. But we, um, we are asking you, even today, you, you can email us that you're going to do it. You can use the Church Center app, which a lot of people have done that. But we'd like to have at least 25 trunks for Trunk or Treat. If you don't know what that is, uh, you just simply take your pickup truck, your SUV, your Toyota Corolla. It doesn't matter because they all have a bed or a trunk or something. And you turn it into some kind of theme. Last year, some people did just decorations. It was really cool. Um, I, it was a Monday night last year, so uh, I just played the Monday night football game on mine, which was really good. Um, and I'll probably have something sports and football related again this year. But uh, we, we do need your help for that. We need trunks. So if you're going to do one, can you let us know, please, today? And then we do need candy. And you can drop that candy off during the week at the church. And uh, that way the staff can make sure that it's, it's, it's legit and sample it. Um, so we do have that going on. Next Sunday, we have baptisms. So if you have not been Biblically baptized, we do what's called believer's baptism. That is a baptism by immersion under the water uh, after your profession of faith in Christ. Uh, that's what believer's baptism is. If you have questions on that, I know we've got a number of people lined up. If you have reached out to me, we'll be contacting you this week with information. But we're excited next Sunday about doing baptisms together. Some other good stuff in there. So just be mindful of that. Now, I'm going to pray, and then uh, we'll look at something in Acts, kind of a little bit of a preview, and then we'll pray. Lord, uh, thank you for this time. And God, I know I'm under the weather and um, not super uh, <laughs> clear-minded right now, so I pray, like I pray every Sunday, that your words would be my words. Lord, I don't want to speak my own. I want to speak truth, speak uh, gospel, speak life, speak uh, wisdom, Lord. All that scripture is, we want to preach and teach that. So I just pray for your help as we do this now. Um, Lord, uh, teach us. God, I'm really excited, Father, about going through the book of Acts as a church together. It's very timely for us. So uh, help us, we pray in your name. Amen. Now, today we're going to cover the first five verses <coughs> and do a little bit of an intro. But before I do that, I do want to ask you to call your attention to Acts chapter 1. I want you to look at verse... 6 and 7. So this is post-resurrection. We're going to cover those five earlier verses today, but I do want you to look at verse 6. It's very timely. 
So when they had come together, this is the disciples, the apostles in the upper room, and they're talking to Jesus, and they, they ask him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? So, so it's interesting that after Jesus' resurrection, the apostles, the disciples, the followers of Jesus still really have their mind on one thing, and that is, is it time now? Is it time for you to establish this earthly kingdom? Because remember, they understood from the Old Testament that it taught that Messiah would come and Messiah would rule and reign from Jerusalem, right? And, and they understood that. They just missed the fact that that was his second advent. The first advent was a spiritual kingdom. So they asked Jesus this. Now, look at his reply. And I want you to notice one important thing that's not in his reply. So he says to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. And then he goes on to talk about the Holy Spirit. One thing you'll notice Jesus doesn't say there is, oh, guys, you're wrong. That's, that's, that's gone now. That's really important for us to understand because two weeks ago on Saturday morning, October 7th, which was my son's wedding in North Carolina, woke up that morning to the horrible news of what was going on in Israel and was just horrified at the atrocities there and the senseless acts of violence and murder there against any people, much let alone the Jews, but it was just awful. And, and, and I think it's interesting here that the boys, one of the first questions they ask Jesus right before he leaves, their, their last conversation has to deal with the nation of Israel, has to deal with future things. And I, I do want to start our time off today with some intentional time to pray for the nation of Israel. Uh, I know, look, there's a lot of opinions. There's a lot of frameworks and constructs out there regarding end-time events and the nation of Israel, and the return of Jesus to establish his earthly kingdom. I understand that. If I was to start throwing out all those terms, you know, who's pre-mill, who's post-mill, who's all-mill, who's uh, pre-trib, who's mid-trib, who's post-trib, who's, you know, whatever, who's confused. Um, <laughs> I know, and that's, again, we've said this. When, we talked, when, we, when I preached through the All of That Discourse, I said, you're welcome to hold pretty much whatever position you want in this congregation regarding those things, because the Bible, look, let me just simply, let's boil this down. When it comes to these things, we are not on the planning team. We're on the welcome team. Does that make sense? When it comes to these things, we're on the welcome team. And so uh, there's a lot of people out there that have a lot of differences. But, but there is something special about the nation of Israel. You have to grant that. There is something special about those, those people in that land. Um, and when it, when it comes to Israel, again, there's a lot of different opinions. And for almost 2,000 years after Jesus was ascended and went to heaven, uh, in, in, in the year 70, so 70 AD, about 40 years after Jesus has ascended into heaven, uh, Titus Vespasian, Roman general, comes in and he levels Jerusalem. He, he flattens it, literally the, the temple, brick by brick to get the gold off, it, it, it's flattened. And for about 2,000 years, the Jews were a people without a home. And that affected a lot of eschatology for a lot of people for, 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 for 2,000 years because it seemed like, well, perhaps the nation of Israel is just done. They have no hope. They have no future. They have no promise. They have no covenant. But then, of course, May 14, 1948, almost overnight, they're given the land. And that changed a lot of opinions and, and shedded some new light on how we interpret Scripture in the nation of Israel. Bottom line is, and, 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 and everything happening over there, you know that's a problem almost as old as time. Because when you get into Genesis, I believe it's 14, uh, with Abraham and Hagar and Ishmael and Sarah and Isaac, you, you see what happened almost 3,000 years ago is still, those issues are still plaguing the Middle East. So regardless of your eschatology, we should be thankful for the nation of Israel and the Jewish people. In Genesis 12, and I want you to look up on the screen up here, it says, uh, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. 
and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, the fulfillment of that was who? Jesus, right? How was all the nations of the earth blessed? Through Jesus, and Jesus was a Jew. Jesus came through that lineage. And so God blessed all the nations, all the world, through the nation of Israel. I want you to look up here at Romans chapter 9, what Paul would write. And I really, actually, uh, this, this is so important to, to remember. This is New Testament now, y'all. This is New Testament. With Christ as my witness, Paul would write, I speak with utter truthfulness. My conscience and the Holy Spirit confirm it. My heart is filled with bitter sorrow and unending grief for my people, my Jewish brothers and sisters. I would be willing myself to be forever cursed, even cut off from Christ, if that would save them. So how much does Paul love his nation and his people? The point where he's saying, I would go to hell if it would save our people. Then he goes on to say, they are the people of Israel, chosen to be God's adopted children. God revealed his glory to them. He made covenants with them and gave them his law. He gave them the privilege of worshiping him and receiving his wonderful promises. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are their ancestors. And Christ himself was an Israelite as far as his human nature is concerned. And he is God, the one who rules over everything and is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. Paul would tell us this is why we should pray for the people and the nation of Israel, the Jewish people. In Psalm 122.6, we are told to pray for peace. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Pray for peace in Jerusalem. And it says, may all who love this city be secure. May they prosper Psalm 25, 22 says, Redeem Israel, O God, out of all his troubles. So we pray for the salvation of the Jewish people, that that Jesus, that Yeshua would open the eyes of the Israelites, of the Jews, to see him as Messiah, as the one, the anointed one, the chosen of Israel. We pray for the salvation of the Jewish people. In Romans 10, Paul would continue to write. Paul Paul would say in Romans 10, Dear brothers and sisters, the longing of my heart and my prayer to God is for the people of Israel to be saved. Now look, two things can be true at the same time, can't they? First of all, we love and we pray for the people of Israel. But we also care about all people, all nations, tribes, and tongues. We pray for the salvation as well as of the Palestinians. We pray for the salvation of those in Hamas and Hezbollah, those in Syria, those in Jordan, those in Iraq, Iran, all those Middle Eastern countries. We pray for all people. That's why as we go through Acts, we will see the struggle that the early church has as the gospel goes to groups who they personally don't like. And that's a real struggle for them. They're like, God, why are you saving them? Well, why would God save us? That's the first question we should ask. But we want to pray for all these people. What, what, what this whole situation needs, not to oversimplify it, because I know it's complicated, trust me, but it needs Jesus Christ. And whether that's now or whether that's his return, we know that he will make, all, regardless of your eschatology, we all agree, Jesus comes back and he wins. And he does bring his kingdom and establishes it on this earth. And peace will rule and reign through the Prince of Peace, which is exciting. So I'm going to go ahead and pray for Israel and pray for the Pray that miraculously, the gospel, that it would go into this situation. That God would use this to make the name of Jesus great and that he would reveal himself to these people on all sides and all places. Would you pray with me together for Israel? Lord, we pray for all nations. We pray for salvation to go to everybody involved in this situation right now. But we we know um, what a special place. We see it from Paul, of course, the Old Testament. Lord, um... I pray that peace would rule and reign there. God, I pray especially, Lord, I I don't think there's a nation, there's a people group that have been lied about and misrepresented any more than the Jews. Lord, even right now we see in media outlets, we see just all over the place such misrepresentation, such misinformation about about the nation of Israel and the Jews, and and it grieves me, it saddens me, but Lord... um, What I know is it's not by my might, not by my spirit or my power, but by yours. 
and yours alone. So God, please, uh, we just pray for them. We pray that you'd bless and protect them. Pray that uh, your spirit would rule and reign, Lord. And, and no matter what happens, we are excited because we read the back of the book and we know who wins. So Lord, uh, I know whatever happens, your sovereign will works through it all. And that's why we can put our heads on our pillows at night and sleep. Because we know when we wake up and read the news and as bad as it is, and it is bad, uh, we know you're in control. And that's wonderful. Bless our time now as we get into Acts. We pray in your name. Amen. Amen. All right, thank you. All right, Acts chapter 1. We're going to do an intro today, kind of like a here we go. I'm really excited. Um, you think about Wizard of Oz, the phrase lions and tigers and bears. Oh my, right? Acts is like missions and martyrs and bacon. Oh my. And if you look in your Bible, a lot of you where it says the Acts, what, what, it, just tell me here, what does your Bible say? It says the Acts what? And I'm, to be honest with you, I'm not sure why it says that. Because we know that the apostles themselves did not do these things. It was the Father, it was the Son, it was the Holy Spirit. I think it should be called the Acts of the Trinity, but they didn't ask my opinion when they put that in there. So, um, But we call it the Acts because it is the early church as God uses the apostles. So the background and setting, this book is super important because if you were in your Bible and you went straight from John uh, to Romans, imagine the disconnect you would have if you went right from John to Romans. Does that make sense? All of a sudden it's like, who's this Paul guy? What's he talking? Wait, the, the gospel, now he's writing, he's writing letters to churches in Asia Minor, in Europe, and what, what, what's going on here? So it's a, a very, very, very important book to bridge from the Gospels to the Epistles in the latter part of the New Testament. So it serves as a bridge between the Gospels and the Epistles. Um, the author is Luke, and uh, it's interesting to think about Luke. What was Luke's profession? He's a doctor. So a lot of people have the idea that all the apostles, all the early church leaders, they were all, they were all just a bunch of poor, ragtag misfits. Well, Luke definitely was not poor. I've never met a poor doctor, and good for them. I don't, you know, I want my doctor to be taken care of if I see a doctor. Um, but Luke probably wasn't a Jew. He has a, he has a Greek name, Luke. Um, we're told a few things about Luke. In Colossians 4, verse 14, Paul talks about Luke. The beloved physician greets you, as does Demas. Now, Later, it's only going to be Luke. Matter of fact, in 2 Timothy verse 4, chapter 4, verse 11, it says, Luke alone is with me. Get Mark. There's a whole story there, which we look forward to getting into here. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is very useful for my ministry. Very useful to me for ministry. Uh, the genre, the type of, of book that, which is very important, the context is this is a historical narrative. This is a telling of history of the early church, about 30 years. It was, uh, this is a recorded history of about 30 to, say, about 62. Um, now, being a historical narrative, this book is filled with, if there's any book you've got to pay attention to, descriptive and pres prescriptive, this is, this is a book. Because there are many things in the book of Acts that are simply prescriptive. They're just simply, pre uh, I'm sorry, they're descriptive. They're simply describing the events. They're just telling what happened. It's not a, this is what happened, so you should do it too. However, there are parts of Acts that are very prescriptive. There are things that are prescribed for us. Things regarding elders, things regarding deacons. A lot of that stuff, that's going to be in Acts. So you say, well, how do we tell what's descriptive and prescriptive? Well, the rest of the New Testament helps us to understand those things. And so we'll talk about all that as we go through. But you do have a lot of description and a lot of prescription there. Um, the outline, the overview, you can really break Acts down into three main chunks. Um, hoping to cover most of this first main chunk before Advent. So Acts 1 through 7, it is the church established. And that takes place where? In Jerusalem, just like Jesus said. Jerusalem is ground zero for the gospel. It's ground zero for the church. Begins there at Jerusalem, as we'll see beginning in chapter 2. So chapters 8 through 12, that would be the second part, which is the church enlarged 
as the gospel and the church begins to spread. It's really a lot like, like a franchise, okay? Um, we are very excited right now that the Lord's favorite burger, In-N-Out, is going to be opening soon. <laughs> so um, if, you, if you want a little bit of heaven, go get the In-N-Out burger and the In-N-Out shake. It's superior. But get the Chick-fil-A fries, <laughs> okay? And then you'll know. You're like, wow, this is good. Thank you, Jesus. Um, so uh, we have the church enlarged. It goes out to Judea and Samaria. And then we have the last part, the last chunk, which is Acts 13 through 28, which is the church expanded, and it goes to the ends of the earth. And they're all, like Acts is just, honestly, it's a fun book to go through. A lot of wonderful things happening, a lot of exciting things. Another way to look at the book of Acts, if you will, is to look at who the central, the key leader is. And there's two sections if you do that. Peter is central, chapters 1 through 12, and then Paul takes over and becomes the key the key figure in 13 through 28. Now, I want to give you here, and I'm hoping you write stuff down, um, I want to give you keys to understanding the book of Acts before we get into it. Again, if there's ever a book where it helps you to understand how to interpret scripture, because otherwise you get into trouble, the Acts is one of those books. So, first of all, I'm going to say this, Acts is a transitional book. Acts is a transitional book. Things are changing in real time as we go through Acts. Think about this. You're going to have the introduction of the Holy Spirit, the call to repentance and faith, believer's baptism, the birth of the church, civil disobedience, signs and wonders, the institution of deacons, the first martyr, the expansion into Samaria, the biggest threat to the church becomes its biggest key figure. You have full Gentile integration. You have Peter's porky picnic, as I like to call it, and that's just the first half, okay? If you don't know what I'm talking about with Peter and the picnic blanket, you say, Chris, you sure talk a lot about food. I, I know, I know. You know, at our son's wedding in North Carolina a couple weeks ago, for his rehearsal dinner, uh, they asked me to cook a low country boil. Anybody know what a low country boil is? A few people here love Jesus? All right. <laughs> the only thing kosher about a low country boil is the salt, okay? Because it is like shrimp. It is crawdads, a lot of times it's crab, it's sausage, and Julie's sausage, and all these things. And, and that's all, I can eat that in good consciousness because of the book of Acts, as we're going look to like, look at later. The entire book is centered around the works of the Holy Spirit through the apostles. Now, regarding the apostles, much of what we read regarding the apostles themselves, the capital A apostles, the ones sent personally by Jesus. That is purely descriptive, not, uh, not prescriptive. Okay, for us, it is not, what they did is not normative what the apostles did, but it is normative regarding what the Holy Spirit can do. Okay, these capital A apostles, they had unique authority. They had a unique personal commissioning by Jesus. So Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12, the signs of a true apostle were performed among you with utmost patience, with signs and wonders and mighty works. Look, we understand the Holy Spirit can and still does the miraculous. Okay? The Holy Spirit's ability to do things has not ceased. It has not stopped. Um, you know, it, what gets hard is in our, so, so often in church culture, let me just like have a moment here with you on this. You, you get people who abuse something in Scripture, and then our response to what has been abused is just to ignore it or discount it. Okay? You, have, you have the modern idea in this day and age of what we call the, the NAR, the New Apostolic Reformation. You've got guys like Todd Bentley and Bill Johnson and people who practice and encourage just some strange, some bizarre behavior and just continually look for the next sensational thing. And Acts is going to talk about what a true apostle is. See, when, when people misuse or make weird what God has given us, it doesn't mean we then avoid it. Right? There are people here, when we talk about the Holy Spirit, you immediately like, recoil a little bit, just the name. And it's like, that's not right. And the Holy Spirit is as much God as the Father or the Son is. And the Holy Spirit wants to work in our midst and through us. It's what's, the Holy Spirit is who gives us life and regenerates us. We had, on Friday, 
I, I don't know if I've been a part of a more beautiful memorial service on, than we had on Friday for Judy Fosgreen. And part of why that service was so blessed was because I believe the Holy Spirit blessed that service. It was wonderful. It was so good. But I understand there are people out there that do some strange things and unbiblical things and things for personal, and that's not new. Paul would address that in the Acts himself. But God can do amazing things through ordinary people through the Holy Spirit. Now, the key words here. You have uh, just a couple of things that really dominate this book. The word Lord, Jesus, Spirit, Word, Witness, Baptize, and Church. That word witness, I want to point out, right, is the word, it's the same word, it's, it's, it's martyr, which we get our word martyr from. And this is intentional right now, us going through Acts, because this, this is a good spot for where we're at in the life of our church. It's important because we want to be a church that finds its identity and its marching orders in Scripture, in Scripture alone, right? We, we do not seek to be a part of a camp or a movement or a certain denomination, not that those are bad things, but... You know, we're not looking to be a part of that. We want to be the church that God wants us to be. And we have our book. We have the Holy Spirit. We have the gift of each other. And we'll work and we'll pray for us to follow God according to his leading. And I know, look, it's funny because a lot of people, you got your favorite YouTube commentator or your favorite YouTube preacher or Christian influencers, you know, who tell you things like, hey, if your pastor or your church does, does this or doesn't do it, you need to find a new one. I hear that stuff all the time. It's funny because the, I, the great irony of that to me is those same people uh, often are the ones who are like, get all fired up about, you know, uh, um, about the idea of modern day apostles. And, and they themselves, though, will act like one. It's very ironic to me how people want to tell you, <laughs> it's like, hey, what I know, there's, there's one thing that fences us in as a church, and that's scripture, not man. The God of Acts is the God of us in Living Hope Bible Church. All the early church had was the Holy Spirit. For them, they had the Old Testament, the Torah. They had leaders who feared God, not man, filled with the Holy Spirit. So, all right, so that's our intro. Let's go ahead and look at the first five verses because it's a recap and it, and it sets the stage. It is the transition verses to get into Acts. So, verse 1. <clears throat> verse 1 says, in the first book, all right? And I'm going to stop and interrupt you, sorry. A lot. In the first book, well, okay, well, this is the what book then? This is the second book. What is the first book? Luke's gospel. So Luke, act, uh, as a matter of fact, in the early church, a lot of times, after Acts was written and after Luke were available, they would bundle them together. And Luke, the gospel of Luke and Acts, we're just one, one, one book, two different volumes. So in the first book, O Theophilus, who is this guy? Well, there again is different takes, different camps on who Theophilus is. Um, maybe he was a very wealthy person that funded Luke's writing, both the gospel uh, of Luke and the book of Acts. He could be a real person. We don't have any other evidence for that. But what's curious is his name. And you, you may not realize, you know what his name means. What does Theo mean? God. What does Philo or Phileo mean? It means brotherly love. So when you call someone Theophilus, what you're saying is, you're not calling them Theophilist. Theophilist. Get it? I'm sorry, dad joke. <laughs> Shoot. Um, that phrase would be literally one who loves God. So he could be writing this to just all Christians under this, this larger heading of Theophilus. We don't know for sure. But in this first book, well, in the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. And that's important because a lot of people like what Jesus did, but they didn't like what he said. And Luke here is saying, hey, I am writing down, I am, I am uh, I'm both... I have both an eyewitness and I have eyewitnesses to these things. So he says, in my first book, and that's what the Gospel of Luke is all about. It's the life of Jesus, what he did and what he said. So that's, that's a very important uh, first verse to look at there. I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. Verse 2, until <clears throat> the day when he was taken up. And that's what we're going to look at starting next week is the ascension. 
until the day he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. Again, that's an important thing. Luke is saying there are these apostles who were personally, directly chosen, capital A apostles. Apostle means one who is sent. And Jesus sent out, remember how many apostles were there? You're like, uh, uh, trying to, you're trying to remember. There's 14, okay, because you had the original 12. Judas is gone. Matthias, next week we'll talk about that. Matthias replaces him. And then one born out of time, as Paul describes himself, you have the Apostle Paul. So there are 14 people who were the capital A Jesus sent out apostles. And it says here, whom he had chosen. So that's important because there are people, like if you hear somebody in this day and age say, yes, I'm an apostle sent personally by Jesus. Just say, no, you're not. <laughs> okay, because that doesn't happen. That was, that was here. We are all little a apostles. We are all sent on behalf of Jesus. But Jesus didn't come to you or me or Todd or whoever and tell them, yeah, you're going out. So that's an important thing to understand there as we get through this. Now, verse 3, it says, He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs. That's, that's a really cool little nugget. It says that he was with them. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs. It says here, he appeared to them during the 40 days, that's the 40 days between his resurrection and his ascension, and speaking about the kingdom of God. Um, we are told in other places in Scripture that Jesus showed himself to many people. At one point, he appeared to 500 people. So there's all these proofs, and you know there's proof of his resurrection because the book of Acts, the only thing that keeps these guys alive and going is the fact they personally saw Jesus Christ. That, that resurrection changed them from cowards right, into champions for the Lord. So it's really exciting there. Um, for me, that's a very much an apologetics type thing. Verse 4 says, And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said you had heard from me. So Jerusalem, remember, Jesus didn't necessarily do a lot of ministry. His epicenter for ministry in, in the Gospels is not Jerusalem, it's Galilee. Okay, because that's where the disciples, the apostles were from, most of them. So, but now it has moved, and that's, that's Old Testament scripture there, it's moved to Jerusalem. So he says, uh, I, I, he says, don't depart from Jerusalem, but wait, and that's all going to happen here in these first couple of chapters. And then verse 5 is the promise. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit, or in the Holy Spirit, not many days from now. Let's look at verse 4 and 5. So it's interesting. In verse 4, it says, while staying, a lot of you will have a note in your Bible where it says staying, that, because that same word is the word eating. One of the things that blows my mind is that Jesus in his resurrected body, on a number of times, he ate with them. So for those of you like me who are foodies and you like, you appreciate that, there, I, I you know, I don't think our glorified bodies will need the nourishment of food, but apparently Jesus ate with them. And right here it says he stayed and he ate with them. In, in Luke's first volume of the Gospel of Luke, the last thing Jesus did was to summarize his earthly ministry from the Old Testament. And he pointed out the plan had always been for Messiah to suffer on behalf of his people and conquer death on the third day. His plan had always been to call the nations to repent of sin, to receive his forgiveness, and trust that his grace is sufficient to save. The city of Jerusalem had always been the Lord's intended light on a hill and would finally become the starting point of world evangelism. So that's exciting. And then in verse 5 where he talks about here that, 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 that they're going to be baptized. He says, for John baptized. Which that's, that's referencing John the baptizer. And John the baptizer, he baptized people in the Jordan River, and it was a baptism of repentance. Okay? It was an immersion there. And I do want to point out, this is a good verse for you to understand and realize that the word we translate, translate baptized, it does not always mean to dunk in water. 
like what it says, baptized with or in the Holy Spirit. It really would have, I wish that our English Bibles used the word immerse, because baptism is just a transliteration. The Greek word is baptizo, so we just took that and changed it into baptized. So a lot of people, and they struggle with, well, is baptism a part of salvation? Well, the question is, I mean, the answer is, which one? Okay, we are to be baptized in Jesus as far as, we are to be immersed in the Lord and his redemptive work. Now, up there next Sunday, when we water baptize people, that is the visual picture and we, of that salvation. So that's, that's just Meridian tap water or Boise tap water. Ain't nothing going to save you about that, right? But that is, we do that because Jesus said to do that to show others. So it's, a, it's an important first step of obedience. We actually make a big deal of baptism. It's a way to show I am publicly professing, I identify with Jesus. It's the biggest proclamation you could ever make to the world. So baptism is cool. Water baptism is a big deal. But water baptism doesn't save anybody. And it's not a part of your salvation. It's a result. It's an evidence of your salvation. And this verse here, when it talks about being baptized in or with the Holy Spirit, not many days from now, that's going to happen in the upper room. So it's a really good thing to keep in mind there. Matter of fact, like you take a verse like um, Mark 16, 16. Let's go ahead and put Mark 16, 16 up here. All right, it says, uh, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Like, see, Chris, right there, and I've had these conversations over many years in ministry. I've met really good people who are like, nope, you're not fully saved until you've been baptized in the water. And this, of course, is one of the verses. But it's funny, because if you just keep reading the verse, it says, well, whoever does not believe will be condemned. Okay? I think the whole idea is, it's like every time I've done a wedding, I've done a lot of weddings, at the end of the wedding, what does the couple do? They kiss, right? It would be weird, it would be odd if that couple did not kiss. That kiss is a visual display of this union of these two. And baptism, again, is that picture. It's like, in a lot of times, it is naturally just attached, like a boxcar, if you will, on that train of salvation. It's an important first thing, to be sure. But it is not something that saved us. And part of that is understanding that when it says to be baptized sometimes in Jesus' name, it says baptized in his name. Not, not getting baptized in the water in his name, though we do baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit, because he told us that. Right? And I know, again, it gets a little complicated. Part of that is if you just, in your mind, when you read the word baptize, if you just read immerse, be immersed in Jesus, be immersed in the Holy Spirit, it helps you to understand with a little more clarity. Now, as we wrap up uh, this morning, <clears throat> I, I do want to point out that the last word in the book of Acts is this word unhindered. Right? Some translations say not hindered. Some translations say they, they weren't bothered. But I like the translation. I like unhindered. It's the last word of Acts. If you read the book of Acts, if you know the book of Acts, you know that Peter, the early apostles and disciples, Paul hinders them. Paul is hindered. How can, how can it say that Paul, and, and honestly, in the bigger picture, the church is unhindered? Look, the purpose of this book of Acts, church, the purpose is to demonstrate from the facts of history that the church has become God's instrument for stewarding the new covenant, that the church is guided by his spirit, and that nothing can prevent Jesus from building his church, unhindered. I hope we all understand this morning here at Living Hope Bible Church, at Living Hope, I hope we understand that we do not personally, we do not want to hinder what God is sovereignly doing in this church. If God could take that ragtag group, that group that had just days previously denied him, turned their back on him. They ran away and they fled. They were discouraged and they were defeated. They were done. Peter went back to fishing. He went back to his old life. And even after Jesus showed up, Peter still is like, nah. Nah. That's why I love Peter. Right? It's like, hey, if God could, when we get to the end of Acts and, and, we, and we just reflect and rejoice on what God did there and even here at this church, uh, it's amazing. I mean, God is still at work today. So when we read this, that same power in the book of Acts is still in the Holy Spirit. It's still in God's people today as far as the church went. 
and what they did. We want God to have his way in this church. We can't control what other churches do. Other people do. But here in this church, we should be praying that God would work unhindered in this place. Amen? Because if we would just get out of the way, honestly, I'm including myself, we just get out of the way and let God do his thing, my oh my, and let his glory be what we care about and the good of people. As we sang earlier, there's nothing that our God can't do. I'm going to go ahead and call the uh, ushers up for our offering and uh, worship team, if you go ahead and head back up this way. I'm going to ask uh, at the end of the service, I'll come up and close this out, but if we could have our elders down front at the end of the service, and maybe a couple of the people to help pray, I am not going to share this beautiful feeling with anybody by praying with you after the service, so I'm going to duck out. But um, if you need prayer this morning, we will have our elders and a few people up here to pray with you. You know we always do that. That's an important part of what we do. So let me go ahead and pray, and then we'll sing and take up our offering. Lord, we love you. You're amazing. You are awesome. I just, um, God, when we show up at this place on Sunday mornings, may we, on our, even when we get up on a Sunday morning, may there just be something special, some, something about showing up with the people of God in this place, worshiping you, Jesus, getting into the word, letting the word speak freely and truly, um, regardless of personal opinion, but just the truth of the word. God, uh, I, I just feel like, um, Lord, you're just, you're just awesome and amazing, and thank you for using weak vessels. Uh, thank you for your grace. It is sufficient for all of us. Pray that you would bless our, our congregation. Lord, be with our staff. I, didn't know, I know so many of them are sick, and um, I know we got a lot of people right now that it's just that time of year, and uh, so Lord, please take care of us. We ask in your name. Amen.